Hi, welcome. I'm Marlon Williams and we're just going to be doing a little bit of video tutorial today. The million dollar question for macroeconomists might be, why do some countries grow and some do not? Or at least, why do some countries grow faster than do others? Robert Sola, Nobel Prize winner of economics in 1987, he provided a reasonably good explanation, reasonably good model that gives us good insights into the driving force behind economic growth. We describe Sola's model as an exogenous growth model because the main driving force in his model, that being the growth in technology, that was actually exogenous. And so today, what I'm just going to be doing is showing the equilibrium or the steady state in Sola's growth model. And I'm going to give a brief explanation of why capital accumulation cannot be the driving force behind sustained economic growth. Sola's growth model can be summarized essentially in one graph. And to do so, we're going to think about our values on a per labor unit basis. So for instance, we're going to think about our output per person, small y, as our total output divided by our labor units. Our labor units here, we can measure it either in terms of hours, preferably. But for simplicity, let's just think about it as per person. So this is our output Per person. And similarly, we're going to think about our capital K as our aggregate capital divided by L. That's our per person capital. So in constructing Sola's model, what we're going to have is on our vertical axis, we're going to have output and we're going to have investment. On our horizontal axis, we're going to have capital K. The first thing we need for our model here is our aggregate production function. Saying, tell me your inputs, how many units of inputs you have, and I'll be able to tell you the maximum amount of output you should be producing. Here, we're assuming the, Cobb, the standard Cobb-Douglas form. So we have our output per person is equal to our A, which is our total factor productivity. You can just sort of think of that as the amount of the technology index in this economy. K, or <clears throat> per person capital, that's just raised to one third. The one third here, you can think of it as one third of the income that's created in this economy goes to the owners of capital and two-thirds would be going to or labor. Labor doesn't show up here because as we said before, we're thinking about this y in terms of y divided by L. The L is normalized, okay? So we can write this or we can draw a representative graph that looks something like that. Y is equal to A raised times K raised to the one-third. The essential feature of this production function is that it suffers from diminishing marginal return. Saying, the more capital that you have, the less valuable adding more capital is. So initially, when we don't have much capital and I get more capital, our output goes up quickly. If I have lots of capital, then adding more capital to it doesn't do all that much for us. Yes, output still goes up, but not as much. So what we see here is that the slope of the function continuously decreases. Output is, de is increasing at a decreasing rate. So once we have the production function, we want to know, ask, well, what's happening in terms of investment? Because ultimately what we're thinking about is what happens to capital? How do we know what capital, how much capital we're going to have in equilibrium. To understand that, we need to know what's happening in terms of investment. So that's our I. It's saying here we're taking some fraction of our income or some fraction of our output and we're saving it, call it that fraction S, which 
in turn becomes investment. That's that point. The share of our production that goes towards increasing the level of capital. So based on that function, what we see here is just our investment function i is equal to s times y. It has the same shape as our y function. It's just proportional based on our s. Once we have that, then we need one more piece of information for us to know what capital level we're going to get to. That we describe as or break even investment. Simply, all that is saying to us is it's the amount of investment necessary to maintain the current level of capital that we sort of have in this time period. So, what does that involve? Well, there are two things that we need to account for. We must recognize that some of our capital is going to depreciate. It's either going to become obsolete or it's going to get worn out. And so we must at least compensate for the amount of capital that is going to be depreciated. Secondly, we must recognize that there is what we describe as dilution. If we have labor units increasing and capital not increasing enough, then on a per unit or per person basis, our capital will decline. So what we're saying here, break even investment, which is simply the investment we need to keep our current capital level unchanged, we need to account for two things. We need to account for the fact that some amount of the capital will be depreciating. And secondly, we need to account for the fact that we're going to have population growth. So our D here is just our depreciation rate, or N is our population growth rate. So you can now see that our break-even investment is just going to be D plus N into K. D and N are just constants. And it's saying the more capital we have, the more investment we need to keep that capital unchanged. Because D and N are just constant, then our break-even investment line is just a straight line. It's a linear function. So this, we're going to call it B, E, I. Break-even investment. And that's just going to be D plus N into K. Let's now think about equilibrium. Our equilibrium, we're going to show, is the point where our break-even investment exactly equals to our actual investment. It's going to be where these two points intersect. So let me just go ahead and denote it here. Call that our K star, which solely described as the steady state capital. Let's illustrate why we describe this as our equilibrium. Let's assume for some reason that we're starting to the left of K star. So we have perhaps our capital being there initially at K1. If we trace this up, it hits our break-even investment curve first. That's B, E, I, call it 1. If we trace this further up, it hits our actual investment curve. We call that I, 1. What is this saying to us? It's saying to us, if K1, or actual capital per person is less than or steady state capital per person, then our actual investment is going to be greater than our break-even investment. We're investing more 
than is necessary to keep our in our capital unchanged. We're investing more than is required to maintain the current level of capital per hour, as we said, per person. What does that mean? It means it necessarily means capital must rise. Invest in more than is required so that additional that we're investing increases or capital per person. If we were to the right of K star, then what we would see is when we trace it up, it hits our actual investment first, saying to us that we're actually investing less than is required to maintain the capital per person. Which therefore means, if we're to the right of K star, capital would fall. The only place where there's no tendency to change, by definition in equi equilibrium, is at K star, where our actual investment exactly matches or break-even investment, saying we're investing exactly the right amount necessary to keep or capital per person unchanged. The main reason for this result is that our production function exhibits diminishing marginal return to capital. So in summary, our K star is our steady state capital. It's the equilibrium. That's where the model tends towards. If we're to the right of K star, capital will fall. If we're to the left of K star, capital will increase. The main reason behind this is that for low levels of capital, two things are happening. It's very valuable for us to add more capital because the marginal product of capital is high when capital is low. And secondly, increasing our capital is relatively easy based on our break-even investment function being upward sloping. It's saying low capital level requires relatively low investment to get it higher. The complete opposite is true when capital is high. It's not as valuable because adding more capital gives us lower increases in our output than when we have little capital. And secondly, it's harder to maintain these levels of capital. We have to be sacrificing more by saving more, consuming less. And so essentially, what Solar's model is telling us is that if we're looking for capital to be the sustaining driving force for growth, we're looking the wrong place. Because capital is going to increase, but only up to a point. Once we get a case star, if we go beyond, there's going to be pressure for capital to fall. And so we're going to be moving up along our Y, meaning economic growth. But that's going to stop once we get a case star. Once we get to the steady state, then we're simply just maintaining the capital per person, maintaining the output per person, which means we need something that is going to change outside of capital, and that something is A. That something is technology, or TFP. And that's why we describe Solo's growth model as being an exogenous growth model, because ultimately the driving force behind Sustained growth, T growth in TFP, we don't explain where that growth comes from. Thanks for stopping by, and please do check out the other uh, video tutorials that are available on my website. It was great having you. Thanks.